shring ka e i la ring asa ka la ring sa ka la ring sa hoin kling ring shring namaste so today we're going to do the bija syllable sao and this is the last bija in the first line of the Mahasodashi Mantra. So after Ain comes Sauho, known as Parabija. Para means transcendental. It's also known as Hridaya Bija. Hridaya means in the heart. Or Amrita Bija. Amrita means nectar. Or deathless. Mrityu is death, so Amrityu is deathless. Shiva explains to Shakti about this in the Paratrisaka Vivarana, verses 9 and 10. O oh, gracious one, it is the third Brahman, Sat or Sa, united with the 14th vowel, Au, out of the 16 vowels well joined with that, which comes at the end of the Lord of Vowels, Visarga, or Aha, used in the 16th vowel, Aha. See, each of the Sanskrit characters has a deep meaning. So when these characters are joined together to form the Bija, they have a distinct meaning. It's not true, as some Western interpreters say, that this mantra is formed of nonsense syllables, huh? but simply because he has no contact with the actual disciplic lineage, he doesn't know the meaning, that's all. So don't listen to arrogant Western scholars. <laughs> Go to the disciplic lineage and get the real meanings of all these things. Therefore, sa is formed out of the combination of sa plus au plus aha. Sao. Again, it is said in the Paratrishika Vivarana, verse 26, He who knows this mantra in its essence becomes competent for initiation, leading to liberation without any sacrificial rites. Now, this is very important because it indicates the Vivartavada. Sacrificial rites, of course, are prescribed in Vedas and are important parts of the uh, karma yoga and bhakti yoga paths. But once one realizes the uh, conclusion of these lower paths, then one reaches the vivartavada path of deep meditation on emptiness, in which there are no sacrificial rites. Uh, there are no outward ceremonies of any kind. One simply sits in meditation and goes deep into the reality of consciousness and being. So this is known, this initiation is known as uh, Nirvana Diksha. Uh, the initiation into Nirvana for final liberation. Where Nirvana means complete emancipation from birth and death from samsara. The scripture proceeds to say, goes on to say, that one who elucidates the proper meaning of this bija is known as Shiva himself. Shivo, hung. Now, we've talked about this before. That when one reaches self-realization in the mode of emptiness, that one becomes as good as Shiva. And because of this, Shakti wants only to serve him, because this is her purpose. When Shiva experiences amnesia and comes into the material world as Jiva, uh, one who takes birth, then he forgets all about his real nature. He becomes covered over by body and mind. And even though he is nothing but pure unconditioned awareness. 
Still, he forgets his actual identity and starts thinking, I am the body, I am the mind, and so on. I am subject to karma, I am subject to rebirth, I am an individual, and so on. So, in this condition, he becomes lost. So Shakti arranges the material energy in such a way that there are constant shocks, constant suffering, that gradually awakens Shiva to his real identity, basically forces him to pursue self-realization until he reaches the actual knowledge Shiva. Um, at that point, Shakti surrenders to him and becomes his maidservant. So this is the highest state of nirvana. So just in case you Buddhists have any problem with this, <laughs> in the story of Buddha's enlightenment, Maya comes to test him, isn't it? Who is Maya? Shakti. So Maya is pleased with him and gives him this cooked down milk, uh, the sweet rice, kheer. And this kheer has the potency of completely reawakening his original nature. And so then that night, Buddha, while inquiring into Paticca Samuppada in a state of vipassana meditation, attained complete and final enlightenment. So this is my experience also, that Shakti gives initiation into nirvana. And nirvana is like the most pleasant, beautiful state imaginable. That when I was doing my sadhana in 1984, uh, that she appeared to me. She, her presence was very strong. And then I felt a tap on my forehead and boom, <laughs> I got the first path, enlightenment, realization. So, uh, in the verse above, Shiva refers to the third Brahman. And that's explained in Bhagavad Gita 17.23-26. Aum, Tat, and Sat are the threefold representation of Brahman. And from that alone, Vedas, Vedic scholars, and sacrificial rites have originated. Hence, during the acts of sacrifices, gifts and austerities approved by the scriptures, and during Vedic recitations, Aum is uttered in the beginning. Tat is recited by those who aim for liberation while performing sacrificial rites, austerities, and charity without intent on the fruits of these actions. Sat is recited by those who perform the above acts with faith and on behalf of Brahman. Thus, the Sa, or Sat, referred in this Bija is Shiva himself, which represents his creative aspect of pure consciousness. So this is deep. This is really deep. Sahu means the culmination of the process of self-realization, the actual attainment of Brahman or Nirvana, which is the same thing, just that Brahman is described in positivist Vedic language and Nirvana is described, or Nibbana in Pali, is described in negative logic, negative language by the Buddha. So, Along with these three Brahmans, there are three Shaktis. Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, and Kriya Shakti. During creation, the Chit Shakti of Shiva, after manifesting as Ananda Shakti, or bliss, becomes the above mentioned three Shaktis before entering into the sphere of Maya. Ananda Shakti is known ordinarily as just plain Shakti, normally referred to as Shiva's consort or his Svatantraya Shakti, his exclusive and unique power of autonomy. In other words, Shiva is completely free. He's always liberated. He's never actually in bondage. But because of Maya, he thinks he is. 
And so if we are all actually Shiva, but we are just in a trance of Maya, thinking that we need liberation, that we need sadhana, that we need self-realization, actually we already have it. One time someone asked Ramana Maharshi, how do we know when we're self-realized? And he said, do you exist? <laughs> and of course the person said yes. And then he asked, well, how do you know that you exist? And there was some discussion, which eventually came to the conclusion that I know I am existing because I am aware of being aware. I am aware that I am aware. Therefore, I am. So Ramana said, so Brahman is realized. Brahman is already realized. Just that we, out of ignorance, don't recognize it. So, these three powers can be explained as the subject, I, the object, that, and the subject-object relationship, I, that, or the conscious being, the object of consciousness, and the qualities that, that are illuminated and revealed in that relationship between the subject and object. These powers of Shiva are also known as Sada Shiva, Ishwara, and Suddha Vidya. Okay? Suddha Vidya, perfect knowledge. The fusion between Sa and Ao forms Sao. As a result of this fusion, creation happens, which is represented by Visarga. Aha! This is uh, spanda, the throb or pulsation of the divine towards creation, causing the emission of his three energies contained in the Ao. And with the addition of Visharga, aha, at the end of Sao becomes Sao. This Parabija is not meant for rep recitation or repetition, as like a japa but for the contemplation of Shiva, who alone is capable of offering liberation by removing all differentiations caused by maya. Therefore, one who understands this bija, sahu, becomes instantly liberated. So, is this important? Yes. <laughs> so this concludes the first line. Maha Sodashi Mantra. Aum, Shring, Hring, Kling, Aing, Sao. So Hunter was asking me the other day, is there a way to condense this into like a single meaningful sentence of English? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> There's just too much in it, you know? I mean, you could say, by the grace of the goddess, one attains liberation. You could say that. But if you go into the meaning of each bijam deeply, it reveals that or how one attains liberation by means of this mantra. It reveals the structure, the mechanism under the hood. And by learning the meaning of these bijams, then one can approach the final liberation, Nibbana, Nibbana Diksha, Nirvana Diksha. So those of you who have been initiated in the Siddhi Mantra, the Atma Bija Mantra, or any of the mantras of the uh, Kaula path, uh, the worship of the goddess, then these explanations will help you deepen your understanding and realization of your mantra. And then after chanting your Siddhi mantra for some time, you can request initiation into the Mahasodasi mantra. And then all of these will begin to bear fruit. Uh, I've been chanting it now for about six months and the results are very profound. And also uh, one of our students or friends Janardana Maharaj, 
He's also been chanting it, and he's so blissed out he doesn't even write me anymore. <laughs> he got the result. So he's just chanting his mantra. He's off in the woods chanting his mantra <laughs> at every opportunity. So you should learn this mantra, and eventually you should become initiated into it. Because the version that we're giving is for public knowledge, but the version that you get at initiation is one that's customized specifically for you. So approach this mantra with great faith and use it to become completely liberated. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Hari Hi Aum. Buddha Saranai. <laughs>